Dear friends, speakers, and participants, being a committed pacifist, I chose to speak on a topic that is really very, very close to my heart. Mark already uh, read the title, and you can see it there about reconciliation and peace building. In this endeavor to reach, really, um, a world without conflict, we must never forget what remains the cardinal goal of the United Nations in its quest for peace to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Undoubtedly, the fact that uh, until uh, today we have avoided a third world war is a very rewarding achievement. However, we have not been able to rid humanity from the scourge of war. Hundreds of interstate and intra state conflicts have taken place uh, since the end of the Second World War, and millions, millions of lives have been lost. In the 20th, the 20th century has been characterized by historians as uh, the age of genocide, or the beastly century, during which nearly 200 million people died as a result of wars which too often were devastating for the civilian populations, or as a result of the brutal and genocidal policies of dictators and tyrants that caused untold human losses, destruction, displacement, and famine in many parts of the world. In the short time span since the beginning of uh, the 21st century, humanity has already <coughs> suffered the tragic consequences of at least 30 conventional conflicts, as well as horrific acts of terrorism and other unconventional conflicts, creating unprecedented threats to humanity. With the tragic events of 9-11, uh, a new era of war has awakened, and uh, we see it now spreading aggressively, mostly in Africa and in the Middle East. The human toll from uh, these uh, 21st century conflicts is not comparable yet to the 20th century genocidal dimensions. Nevertheless, conflicts continue to cause violent deaths. We were discussing earlier about Syria. 150,000 people, in their majority women and children, have lost their life in the, in the period of two and a half years. And of course, thousands and thousands of other people in other parts of the world. So violent deaths, uh, primarily of civilians, and forced disappearances, displacement of people, and refugees, uh, refugee flaws of unprecedented proportions, material uh, damages estimated at trillion US dollars, famine, uh, disease, as well as the dissolution, the complete dissolution of the social fabric, with the destruction of the most fundamental social services. And we see this in all parts of the world today, primarily in Africa and the Middle East. If one adds the psychological trauma from the loss or disappearance of loved ones, from the rapes and the torture in the hands of belligerents or insurgent groups and terrorists, then we can get the full picture of the devastating uh, and uh, the human-made tragedy that has shattered societies and has crippled the lives and the dreams of people. 
Since uh, its founding, the United Nations has uh, used diplomacy and mediation to prevent war and to mediate peace between adversaries. Promoting peaceful political solutions to conflict has been and continues to be a charter responsibility and one of the key aims and the key tools of the United Nations. Nevertheless, peacemaking and preventive diplomacy as uh, an instrument uh, uh, in the global effort to reduce armed conflicts have uh, been more effective, especially since the end of the Cold War. We had it before, but since the end of the Cold War, we had more effective mediation efforts and uh, more preventive diplomacy uh, as uh, uh, work of the United Nations. The UN, with the, its peace uh, uh, making and its uh, peacekeeping activities remains highly active in this area in cooperation, of course, with many uh, regional organizations and, of course, individual countries that are contributing uh, to the 15 today uh, peacekeeping operations around the world, as well as the 37 uh, special political missions uh, ranging from uh, good offices mission, mediation uh, uh, missions, and um, uh, envoys and expert groups. As a result, uh, since the end of the Cold War, numerous agreements, uh, including about 40 comprehensive peace accords, including the one in Northern Ireland, uh, but also in other parts of the world regarding East Timor, uh, Somalia, uh, Eritrea, and, uh, and Ethiopia, uh, have been signed uh, to end long-standing armed conflicts. Not all of these uh, uh, agreements have been successfully implemented, uh, though. Uh, some have since uh, collapsed and were succeeded uh, by resurgence of violence, uh, falling uh, in what um, has been called uh, a, a conflict trap, uh, and uh, very rightly so, because that characterizes many countries that have suffered from civil war to uh, relapse uh, into conflict again. Some have been followed by revolt, lawlessness, crime or terrorism, and in some cases uh, led to failed societies. And we know many examples uh, of that. Others, notwithstanding, have resulted in lasting peace. And here is the question. Uh, what makes the difference? How can we lastingly end a conflict? How can we improve the chances that uh, a peace process will succeed? Is peace uh, making, um, peacekeeping, good offices, peace agreements uh, adequate to have a stable uh, peace? I would argue not. And this is how I see it. If an agreement is not perceived as just by a sizable part of the population, uh, if uh, people feel betrayed by their leaders or even by the international community, if political leaderships in a post-conflict situation do not have the political will to implement those agreements, if uh, the people are not adequately prepared for the day after the agreements are signed, if hatred and pain from past grievances and from extreme violence, from atrocities and from genocide are still poisoning the minds and the souls of people, and open wounds fester if poverty is ravaging their lives, if refugees and displaced persons still remain homeless, if the security deficit cannot ensure a peaceful living after the signing of agreements, if children are deprived of education and die from famine and disease, then peace agreements will collapse, and the countries concerned will ultimately relapse into conflict. 
What then are the indispensable components for building lasting peace in war-torn societies and for laying the foundations for sustainable development, democracy, and human rights? I will argue that peace building and reconciliation remain the sine qua non for the effective implementation of peace agreements and for sustainable and stable peace. Now, while uh, peacemaking and peacekeeping have uh, received uh, much more attention and of course much more budget support from the United Nations, peace building activities and reconciliation efforts have been rather recent commitments uh, of the United Nations in the quest for peace. A broad definition, I'm not going to go into any uh, detailed definition of, uh, uh, of peace building, is uh, that it is about action uh, which is meant to identify and to support structures which will tend to strengthen and to solidify peace in order to avoid the relapse into, conf uh, into conflict. Uh, by strengthening, and this is the way to do it, strengthening of national capacities at all levels for conflict management and to lay the foundations for sustainable peace and development. Now, there are two other criteria which are very important is in, in peace uh, building, that the process and the strategies has to be nationally owned, nothing imported from abroad, nationally owned, so the countries concerned have to have the ownership of the strategies being implemented. And the second criterion is that there is no model fits all. So every country is different. So in every country we have to have an assessment uh, of the situation, of the country's condition, and uh, build these strategies based on the needs of the countries. Now, based on this broad definition, and the experience we have attained so uh, far, I consider the following four categories uh, of action uh, as of utmost importance for any peace building uh, strategy. The first one is international support. Sustained international support remains absolutely necessary in the form of specific programs to help these countries to adopt and to implement strategies for post-conflict peace building and for recovery, to restore and to strengthen governmental functions and administrative capacities, to support political and democratic processes, and to strengthen national capacities for conflict management and prevention. The second concerns human security. Improving human security remains central in peace building. What we have seen in Iraq and what we are seeing in Iraq, in Libya and in Afghanistan and other countries emerging from violent and devastating uh, conflicts is an indication of the great challenges facing the international community in handling situations on the ground. So removing landmines that are responsible for the death and the maiming of thousands of civilians every year. In the majority, we're talking about children that lost their lives or are uh, maimed from, uh, from these landmines. The destruction uh, and the storage uh, or, or um, disarmament uh, is, is another uh, way. Protection of civilians, both during uh, and, of course, after uh, the conflict uh, situations, uh, as well as strengthening the rule of law and law enforcement uh, capacity and initiation of security sector reform remain indispensable projects uh, in peace building activities, and we see now this happening in uh, some of uh, the uh, conflict situations where because of the war, because of the conflict, everything has been destroyed. Institutions have been destroyed. So um, the international community has to come in, uh, of course, 
uh, under the ownership of, of the governments uh, involved and help in the security uh, situation. The third category is provision of basic services. As I said before, wars uh, produce uh, uh, and create a, a lot of destruction of the infrastructure of the basic services uh, that are needed uh, to, uh, 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 to support the population, uh, especially after uh, these violent uh, conflicts. Uh, so uh, it is imperative to ensure uh, the provision of the basic services uh, to the affected population, including, and we're talking about very, very basic uh, things, water, uh, sanitation, health, and education. Uh, we were talking before about the Syrian situation and the uh, millions of uh, children uh, that are uh, uh, without schooling, without proper schooling. So when and uh, uh, hopefully soon uh, this, uh, the, the um, uh, conflict is resolved, these children have, have to go back. And they, we have to, um, the international community has to make sure that they will go back in the proper environment and that they will be able to have all these basic uh, social um, uh, services, uh, primarily health uh, and education. And the fourth category is development. Um, it is very important to uh, support uh, in these uh, uh, war-torn uh, situations, uh, in these war-torn countries to support short-term and of course longer-term development projects that will help the specific countries to recover and be able to attain a sustainable economic growth. Now, another important element is coordination because a lot of international organizations, NGOs, uh, local actors are being engaged in these peace building activities. In, it is important to have a good uh, coordination of all these political, economic, humanitarian development and uh, human rights uh, actors in order for these important strategies, important projects to be successful. Now I turn to um, another issue which is, uh, I think, the most important uh, for me, at least, uh, for uh, building um, a stable peace uh, so that uh, we don't see a relapse into conflict, and this is reconciliation. The recent death of Nelson Mandela, the tireless fighter for uh, racial and social equality, freedom and justice, has reminded us all, if, need, if it's, there is need to be reminded, of the incredible uh, strength and indeed miracle of reconciliation, of the miracle of healing of wounds and forgiving, seeking the truth in order to be able to build a future without hatred. He was the leader who with vision and with wisdom led his country from a racist apartheid system of white domination and racial hatred from uh, bitter division, deep-rooted enmity and bloodshed to a country of forgiveness and the common homeland of all its citizens in a multicultural and multiracial society, a rainbow nation, as he called it. At this point, I want to pay tribute to the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission for South Africa, um, which uh, is a very important process, was a very important process for uh, uh, South Africa and has been a very important process in other parts of the world, like, uh, for example, in Guatemala. Um, now, to reach the goal of a lasting peace and a future without conflicts, more political and financial support should be channeled by the international community towards conflict prevention, early warning, peacemaking, peacekeeping, peace building, and reconciliation, as well as poverty, eradication, and development. Um, regrettably, uh, we continue to live uh, in a heavily militarized world. While the overall uh, annual budget of the United Nations and all its agencies is around 30 billion US dollars, the world military expenditure for 2012 has stood at over one point seven 
trillion US dollars. I give these numbers because these numbers demonstrate the huge gap between what countries are prepared to uh, spend on military security and warfare and what they actually spend for alleviating poverty, for promoting education, health, peace, and development around the world. Let us not forget that most of the warfare today is still conducted by the use of conventional weapons, which are easily obtainable and all too often end in the wrong hands of terrorists and fundamentalists. Unfortunately, large sum of monies continue to be spent for the purchase of such weapons by war-torn countries, which result in a vicious cycle in further impoverishment and the disintegration of their economies. If this vicious cycle, and I will end here, if this vicious cycle is not broken, and the United Nations Charter and international law does not become the yardstick for the conduct of states, then we will continue to betray the very principles on which the United Nations has been founded. And peace will remain as elusive as it has been throughout history. Thank you.